organizers, uh, Pastor Malaku and our brother Jonathan, uh, wanted me to say a few words uh, before we hand over everything to our speaker, uh, Dr. Martha Wright. Um, well, first, on, on behalf of the session, and uh, Pastor Malaku, our evangelist, and Jonathan, the administrator for Clarkston Ministry, I would like to <coughs> express our appreciation to all of you uh, for accepting the invitation and uh, also uh, for coming to, to the seminar tonight. Uh, this, this shows us that uh, uh, God has given us a church uh, that is mission-minded, a church uh, who wants to see the gospel uh, reaching out even to refugees. Uh, and this brings a great sense of joy and uh, gratitude uh, to our hearts. I also would like to welcome our dear sister and friend, <laughs> Dr. Martha Wright. Uh, I, uh, I first met Martha back home in Eritrea. Her husband, uh, Bob Wright, a long, long time uh, deacon of the OPC, uh, worked at uh, Ginda Hospital in Eritrea at, at the Mission Clinic. And uh, Bob was the one who led the uh, construction work at the hospital, at the uh, medical clinic. He, he was the one who um, renovated the uh, medical facility in Ginda. <coughs> and uh, this family has done much uh, in Eritrea for God's kingdom. And then in Uganda, many, many years, uh, she will uh, tell you more about it when uh, the opportunity comes. But uh, Martha, thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, for uh, a willingness to come all over to Atlanta, to Redeemer, to, uh, to, to uh, give this uh, seminar to our members uh, here. Now, I want us to, um, you know, very briefly uh, to ask this uh, important question, why ESL? You know, it's always uh, good and um, somewhat doable, you know, to organize a seminar like this and find um, a good speaker like Dr. Wright and have a seminar. But uh, because we are the Church of Jesus Christ and we are doing ESL uh, as part of our Christian ministry and outreach ministry to uh, immigrants and refugees, I think it's important for us to ask uh, why ESL, and as we ask, you know, that that uh, that question in our mind and in our hearts, I would like to read from Ephesians uh, chapter two, uh, verse nineteen to twenty-two, and I will base what I'm going to say very briefly on those uh, on those verses. So listen, um, listen uh, to the word of God. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So when you think about, you know, this question that I asked earlier, why ESL? One uh, spiritual um, matter and urgency that I, I want to come to your mind is aliens, foreigners, outsiders. You know, Paul is talking about them, including us. We, we at one time were aliens and foreigners to God's kingdom, and God, by his grace, brought us into his kingdom, brought us into his church. 
Now, uh, you all would, would uh, agree with me that uh, America is expanding. And America as a nation is expanding not from, um, from the birth of children only, but America as a nation is expanding from welcoming and receiving immigrants to, to herself. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the Pew uh, Research Center. The research shows that 40 million immigrants live in America. 40 million. And if you go to a supermarket or a restaurant and you look around, you will see different faces. And I'm sure you will see faces from you know, many, many countries, many, many uh, nations whose uh, you know, English you know, for them is a you know, second language. Now, when we think about them as, as refugees and foreigners, you know, this came to my mind as I was thinking about you know, why ESL. You know, when they come here, they come as foreigners. They come as aliens. And this, uh, you know, um, organizations from the government, uh, non-governmental non uh, ministries and organizations, they have programs for them, you know, for them to learn English, to e equip themselves for employment, uh, you know, gain uh, education. And, uh, you know, they, they, they help them, you know, through these programs, they help them to uh, adjust into the, uh, you know, with the life here in America. And it's a wonderful, you know, there are wonderful programs for refugees, even in Clarkston. You know, there are ministries and organizations who does that for refugees. And you will always hear people saying, you know, m maybe, maybe, you know, that thinking always come to our mind, you know. If we have all this, you know, um, <coughs> programs, you know, f by the government and then uh, Christian ministries doing ESL classes, why do we even need to do it? Because they are doing it. Now, it's, it's always about, you know, what your ultimate goal is. You know, you have a goal. You also have an ultimate goal. So the ultimate goal of, you know, most of the programs in Clarkston is to help refugees to stand on two feet. You know, when it comes to supporting themselves, going to school, uh, you know, do well in America. Our goal, you know, is the same goal, you know, we, we help them with immigration, we do gros groceries, we, we do, you know, various things in order to help the refugees that God brought to us through the work in Clarkston. We, we do that, we do all those things. But our ultimate goal is by God's grace, to point them to Christ. So that's YESL, to point these refugees to Christ. And the means, you know, one of the means that God has given us is this program, you know, e ESL. We, we teach them English, and as we teach them English, we, we introduce, uh, introduce them to Christ. We point them to Christ. And... Um, do, do you know very few refugees in Clarkston end up in church? Do you know that? Most of them, they don't go to church. And most programs in Clarkston, their ultimate goal is not to point them to Christ, to point them to church. They don't even talk to them about church. They don't even talk to them about, you know, true worship, you know, and need, you know, for worship. So as... Uh, you know, volunteer teachers 
for ESL evangelism, you know, through ESL classes as a means to uh, point these refugees to Christ. I want to encourage all of you to always keep this in your mind. We do have a mission, and our ultimate goal goes beyond of helping this refugee to adjust with the life here in America, but to meet their Savior and their Lord Jesus Christ, and then become part of the worship of God here at Redeemer. And of course, the uh, long-term plan is to see another church in Clarkston. We're not there yet, but that's the long-term plan. That's why we have an evangelist. We have uh, a ministry apartment in, in Clarkston because we do have a short-term plan and long-term plan. The long-term plan is to plant another church in Clarkston. And, uh, and this, is, this is the means. You know, one of the means that uh, you know, we want to use as a church is you know, you know, offering uh, ESL classes. Now, think about this. You know, when they come here, all these immigrants and refugees, when they come here, the, the, you know, people call them or identify them as what? Aliens, foreigners. You know, the language that the Bible uses for this marvelous purpose. And, and uh, you know, God doesn't want you know, anyone to be a foreigner, a stranger to him, to, to, to God. You know, God wants to make, you know, everyone who believes in his son, Jesus Christ, his child. So, let, you know, the world can call them that, but you and I, as the church of Jesus Christ, who have tested the grace of God, we, you know, we invite them to come to church. Uh, and being a foreigner, an alien, but they become children of God. Even the Great Commission, you see, go to all nations and make them disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, when, you know, Dr. Martha um, gives this seminar to all of us, when we interact with one another about, you know, how to do these classes, how to make them effective. Um, I want all of us, you know, to to keep this in in our mind. We have we have a goal. It's an ultimate goal, and the ultimate goal is to bring glory to our God by pointing these refugees that the Lord would bring to to us to His Son Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate goal. So that's why we are having this, this, this seminar. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to your church to organize a seminar like this. Thank you for providing to us a very gifted and committed speaker, our dear sister, Dr. Martha Wright, thank you for her willingness to, to fly to Atlanta and uh, be a speaker in this seminar. Oh Lord, we pray that uh, you, our God, would use this seminar for your own glory, to use our sister Martha to train and e equip your children to evangelize immigrants and refugees with the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, our ultimate goal is to bring glory to you, to see many refugees come into your son, Jesus Christ, by faith and in repentance. Lord, we ask you to fulfill this for us by your grace and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Use our sister mightily for your own glory and for our edification to give us knowledge, skill, and uh, use this knowledge and skill that 
our dear sister would share with us for the glory of your name. We uh, now commence this seminar in the name of you are God, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And may your name be glorified through these two days. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome, Martha. Um, as I mentioned to some of you earlier, I'm, I'm settling into full um, stage fright here. Even though I have been a teacher for many years, I still get those, you know, nerves when I'm looking at all these people, some of whom I know, some of whom I don't know. And anyway, this is our beginning. Are we good to go, Huel? Do you know? Has um, Doug said? Okay. All right, we're good. Well, briefly, um, many of you do know who I am, but just very briefly, my background is in linguistics. Um, I did, I've done all my degrees in linguistics. I just never got tired of it. Um, I did a uh, bachelor's in linguistics, a master's in applied linguistics, um, for which I wrote a beginner's course in Irish Gaelic for learners in America. So I love language learning, language teaching of different kinds, and I'm always learning from other people. My um, PhD, I did the research in Ginda with the able help of uh, Jonathan here and uh, many other people, and it had to do with beginning English literacy there, um, how they teach reading <coughs> and how children were and were not learning, and how teachers were interpreting the curriculum. So one of the things that was really fascinating about that was seeing that a lot of people can take the same material and get something very different out of it and do something different with it based on what they expect and what their students expect. So some of you I've talked to already, and I've asked you some about your background and your interests. And right at this moment, I want you to take something that you have to write with. Everybody has something to write with, right? Come on, we're students. I always tell my students you have to some, have something to write with and something to write on. <laughs> that always sounds very. And I just want you to jot down a couple of words about what you most want to get out of this time together today and tomorrow. What do you need? What do you most want to get as a prospective teacher. What do you what do you need? And then I'm gonna call on you. This is what I do. I'm a professor, professional caller on it. And then I'm gonna hand out a little uh, list of some of the things that I'm planning to cover. And let's see. Actually, why don't I just go ahead and hand these out? Do you want to just take one down and pass them around? Take one and hand these out. See how well your expectations line up with mine. Here you go. Thanks. Got a few there. Okay. If there are there enough for everybody? Do we need some more down here? We have extras. We have enough for everybody. Just just take them and hang on to them. So, what do you most want to get out of this? Let's see, the Hastings over here. What did you say, just quickly? Knowledge, because I don't Okay, know, know can you say anything more specific? I was looking actually for something more. How to teach, yeah. okay? What would you well, say? How Rachel? to teach ESL and how to share the gospel with someone who uh -huh. has very little English. Oh, yeah. How about you, Strategy. Wilson? Strategies for? More effective communication. Is. Yeah, yeah. Ryan, you're still writing. Ah, uh, he's a real teacher. That's what he's still writing. Yeah. <laughs> I had two initial thoughts. Yeah. I want an understanding of who our audience is and mm. what they hope to learn, mm -hmm. and a template for how to help the learners achieve their goals. Yeah. And Christella? I guess similar, like so knowing what ESL learners, if they, what they're looking for, and like tips on how to help them when they're stuck at certain How to help them when they're stuck, yeah, yeah. You want to talk? What uh, do you think? How to help um, 
we as learners to communicate based on what they are in the mm -hmm. daily basis needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That they can apply. Yeah. Uh, how to help refugees to speak and hear English language well? Mm -hmm. What kind of strategy we follow to help them? Mm -hmm. Like that. Yeah, yeah. How about you guys back here? Uh, I what just wrote really get more comfortable with teaching techniques. Yeah. I've never taught before, so. Yeah, yeah. How to get started. How to get started, like with a beginner, like a rank beginner. Yeah. And let's see. Christina. Christina. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know that uh, for Engli English language learners, they all have different um, strategies that adapt mm -hmm. specifically to their learning lifestyles mm -hmm. and any kind of, um, mm -hmm. I guess, obstacles that might confront them yeah. with regard to adjusting and accommodating their teaching style. Yeah, yeah, to their own like learning styles and expectations, yeah. Deborah? Um, I was hoping to learn some techniques for teaching online. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually have done a lot of that. And it's not that bad. I don't know how many of you taught, uh, have taught online. But teaching adults, okay, this is not like kindergartners, all right? Can't imagine that. But, yeah. Daniel? Oh, yeah. Yes, I was going to say, um, in addition to a high level understanding of this ministry, but also mm -hmm. working in an asymmetric relationship where there's no way I'm going to be learning their language. That's a really interesting point, yeah. Sure, I suppose you could learn a bit. I don't know. Well, I don't refuse but to, but I still yeah, but it's not. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It is a very asymmetrical relationship in many ways. You've got all the, you have the knowledge and that they want. Yeah, Karen, how about you? Um, <coughs> well, curriculum or content. Mm -hmm. Curriculum and content. Pastor Zakarias, what do you want to get out of this time here? I know oh, well, then you're good. You're good. You're good. I really <laughs> yeah. I really would like to learn from you, uh, okay. my dear sister, on how to uh, encourage refugees to feel at home uh, in American church, mm -hmm. worshiping yeah. in English. Yeah. Well, we were talking about a few, few things, too, last night. So having started with that, you can see what I have in mind, OK? I've written out, this is a sort of a, thankfully, Karen helped write out this um, sort of uh, text. This is a lot of what will be on the, um, the PowerPoint here. Let me just adjust this, because this was a different slide. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. So my goals, let me set up the slideshow. Hang on. Come on now, lads. It's working. Great. OK, this is a little different setup from what I'm used to. So the first thing is. I asked you what your needs and wants are. I think you all also want to know what the learner's needs and wants are. Because if you don't have a goal, you won't hit it, will you? And I think most people realize that there is no such thing as English for everyone, everything, every subject. There are going to be limitations. For rank beginners, when I say rank beginners, people who speak almost no English at all, they're going to want to learn a lot of the same things. But as time goes on, and that will, it will happen pretty quickly, I think you'll find that some things differentiate. And so you, you want to be on the same page with your learners in the same way that I want to be on the same page with you. And Pastor Zakarias has already made clear what the purpose of this is. And um, I'll let the uh, leaders of the church handle that. <laughs> that aspect of it in some ways, because I also can't do everything. And I'm just here to hopefully help share some of my knowledge um, based on my study of linguistics and experience teaching different languages to different people. I've studied a lot of second language acquisition theory. Um, and some of that come, does come into play. There's an expression here which I think is very, very, very important. I had a wonderful professor who uh, was just really brilliant in the field. And she was one of the people that coined this term, negotiation for meaning. This is how people learn. In a nutshell, when they are trying to be understood and make themselves understood, it's in that 
interaction back and forth, that they discover things, that they understand things, and that it sticks, and that they begin to, in a, in a sense, build the new language in their minds. Um, you may think of your, your own language, your first language. Oh, instantly, how are, would consider yourselves multilingual? Show of hands, show of hands. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. You have, in the, in the process of acquiring another language, you have to kind of displace certain neurological pathways and create new ones. And the more that you do that over the course of your life, the easier it is for you to acquire another language. You have a certain, what they call neural plasticity, do you know what I mean, like a flexibility. And so many of the learners that you're going to be working with probably have that because they are probably already, many of them will be multilingual. Not all, but many. Um, or they will have some familiarity with other languages as well. But if you can just keep that expression in your mind, negotiation for meaning, if, you're, if there's always this give and take, trying to understand, working at understanding, working at making yourself understood. If I understand correctly, most of you are interested at this stage in the game, in the early stages, in helping people learn to speak. And pronunciation issues are something that is, it, it, it's an issue for virtually everyone in learning a second language. One of the things I think it's helpful to remember, I like to think of language learning as being a little bit similar to learning to play a musical instrument or learning a sport. How many of you play an instrument or have played an instrument, right? What are some of the things that you had to do? Da 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 Okay. It's vocabulary. Yeah. Sorry? It's vocabulary. Yeah, yeah. And it's also muscle memory. Yeah. How many times do you hit a ball when you're playing tennis before you can really do it well? Or kick a ball in soccer or, you know, how, how, how many times does somebody shoot hoops? <laughs> I mean, you do it like thousands of times, and it's fun every time because it's a little different. Learning to speak another language involves using muscles in your, in your face and your throat and everything that maybe you haven't used before, and hearing things. So there's this connection between hearing things, hearing distinctions that you may not be familiar with, and then figuring out how to say those. It's not so easy to teach people to hear things. It's, you can, I think hearing distinctions can be very hard for people who just can't hear them. I have students from Japan and much of East Africa, by the way, not, not in the Horn of Africa, but in the places where people speak Bantu languages. Many of them also do not distinguish R and L in the way that we do in English. And you can say something a hundred times in a row and they can not hear it and can't. They just can't hear it. In the same way that you may not be able to hear the difference between maybe uh, some, there would certainly be, uh, there are sounds in, in Irish, for example, that are very similar. Let me give you an example. Can you hear the difference between mulle and mulle? No. They're two different words. Mulle and mulle. Yeah, 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 right. But imagine that at full speed, okay? And that's what many speakers coming to English struggle with also, is not being able to hear that distinction. Um, so, and there, there are first language influences. We all know that. Everybody knows that. It's, it's what we call an accent, right? And how much does a person have to erase their accent? How much do they? How important is it? What do you think? How important is it for learners to try to sound as much like native speakers as possible? How important is that and why? Why is it or is it not important? What do you think? Yeah. Wouldn't that be important mainly if it's keeping them from being understood in the other language? Definitely, definitely. So there are certain things, there are certain sounds that make a big difference in English. A lot of our vowels. Um, I have studied 
vowels a lot over the years, so t don't get me started. I'll, I'll, I'll go into it some other time. It's a, it's a little boring. But some of them are fairly obvious. Many speakers of other languages would say um, this is instead of this is. But you almost never misunderstand them when they say that. Now, if they say something like rich instead of reach or reach instead of rich, mm, those words are very different. And you, know, you would hope the context would f clue you in, but it might not. You can teach people usually to hear those differences. They can't always uh, uh, replicate them perfectly. But yes, it comes down to whether they can be understood or not. And um, I think that's, that's something that some learners really want. They really want to sound like native speakers. Not everybody can. Not, it's not possible for everyone. Some people are astonishing. Uh, I met a young woman from Japan and she had been in the United States for about six months, ever, in her life. And she, I, th I thought she was from California. She had been living in California for six months. And I, I, it was just amazing. And she had not even had American teachers in Japan. I have no idea how she learned that pronunciation that fast. But she's a rare case. Usually I meet people that have been here for, for 40 years, and they're, you know, they, they still have their accent. Sometimes that's part of who they are, too. It's part of their identity. So an accent doesn't have to be a bad thing. For s you know, people have their own opinions. And I think we can, of course, respect those. Um, it is a liability in some situations. Um, as you well know, there are many negative attitudes towards people from other countries. And for some people, that it results in their not being promoted, or their not being taken seriously, or it can have an, an impact on their quality of life. Um, some of the students I've had in New Jersey, for example, who are from Mexico, um, they realize that there are a lot of <laughs> there are a lot of people who are really prejudiced against people who sound like they're from Mexico, and so they try to work on their accent. One young woman I know, she's a lovely, lovely person. Her English was so good. She couldn't get promoted from bus person to waitress. And it was because they said, oh, well, people can't understand you. Well, I went to that restaurant. And let me tell you, people could understand her. It was just prejudice. So that is there. And it, and it is. It's part of life, isn't it? So we can, we can help people to achieve their goals through some instruction in how to hear things, how to pronounce. There are ways of teaching people to move their mouths. I have some books, I have videos, I have other things I, I can talk about later. Listening, pronunciation, reading, writing, spelling, they're all connected. Did you have phonics in school? OK. I'm a, I'm a phonics fan. Um, that point and say thing, not, not a fan of that for learning to read. And it really does help people learn to write better when they understand the relation between the symbol and the sound. English spelling, yeah, it's tricky. OK, yeah, we, we all know that. There are a lot of irregularities, um, unusual spellings, mixtures of languages. You know why? Do you know why we have such a mixture of spelling types? Do you know why? There, there are a couple of reasons. Obviously, we have l words from different languages. But the big reason that we have this problem with vowels, and you know, you have like bread and reed, breath and beard, you know, all these, th the same symbols representing different sounds in different places. A lot of that has to do with the Battle of Hastings. Any light bulbs going on? Any lights going on here? Oh, okay, take it away. No, you don't. Well, that's as far as I can go. Oh, okay. <laughs> The Norman Conquest, yes. 1066, the French conquered England. They came in, they took over, and they couldn't pronounce English. That's why my name is pronounced right. It should be Richt. There's a W, there's an R, and there's a GH, which is a H or H sound. They couldn't pronounce it. They said, we're not going to say these words. We're going to change it. Now, they didn't consciously do that, but you had generations of learners of English, learning English, 
and changing it. So that, that was one of the main reasons that we have these irregular vowels. Now, do your students really want to know that? I don't know. I actually tell my students about the Norman Conquest, and they think it's really hilarious. Or at least they're humoring me, and they say that. So probably not. Since Hastings is my last name. I say they, they oh, butcher my name. Yeah. And say, like the Battle of Hastings. Is. Yeah. What? Oh well, I <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, like the battle. When I go to to buy something and they say right with a W, and I say yeah, like the brothers, and they say, you know, those guys who flew, yeah. The Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur. How could you forget Orville, Orville and Wilbur, honestly? So one of the things that we can do to help them improve their comprehension, the, some of the folks that I talked to, was it yesterday? When was it? Yesterday, yeah. They mentioned that understanding people is hard. And how are they supposed to speak to people if they can't understand them? And it's so, you know, the frustration that people experience. And I think a key, um, a key task that you can do when you're teaching is try to ask the students what they didn't understand. Now, on the one hand, you say, well, how can they tell you what they didn't understand if they didn't understand it? But if they can just describe being at the supermarket and they went up and someone said something to them, you know, they don't know what it is. Maybe you can practice that kind of scenario, and you might hit on the expression that they didn't understand. Like, I go to a store and somebody says, cash or credit? That's a little hard to understand if you're not a native speaker. Cash or credit? Well, but I already know they're going to say that, so that's part of why I do that. And so teaching people you know, different everyday scenarios helps them to prepare for being there. And you can't teach every expression. You don't want to overwhelm them. But doing some scenario, doing a lot of scenario-based teaching, I think, helps beginners. You can use pictures. You can use real objects. If you're working in their home, there's lots of objects around. You can pretend you're in a shop. My experience with um, a lot of learners was that just being out in public and being like in a, in a shop or a supermarket was often very stressful hugely stressful. They would be shouted at. They would be, people would be annoyed. They'd, they didn't understand things. They couldn't find things. They couldn't ask for stuff. They couldn't read the labels. Um, I've had that experience too, believe me. <laughs> when I moved to Eritrea, I couldn't read things. It was in a different language. And I, I couldn't find things. It was lo I was lost. So then if you teach some of these everyday expressions, they can start to use them, and then they use them every day. Now, do you teach a whole scene at once? No, not necessarily. You may expose them to that. As far as teaching techniques go, a person can only manage a certain amount at a time, and you want to build on what somebody knows. As they call it, um, as they call it in language teaching, they call, you want to teach, they say, I plus one. In other words, known information, what people already know, and build on that a little bit at a time. And so when you teach those everyday expressions, you know, you start with a little core and then build on them adding in some new components, maybe adding in a new person, a new situation each time. Um, now, as far as the everyday language also, a big issue is informal language. Why is informal language in English more difficult to understand than formal language? Like right now, I would consider this fairly, uh, I'm speaking in a fairly formal way. I'm making a point of projecting and enunciating. Is a lot faster, right? It's faster. It what else? Necessarily follow the rules. Yeah, it may not follow those sort of standard. It may not follow what you've learned in your English class. <laughs> in fact, you can yeah. break the rules that everyone understands that you're breaking the rules, which is different. Yeah. Can you give an example of that, Tim? Let's say, like, um, you might colloquially, colloquially use the yeah. word "ain't." Oh, yeah. When everyone knows it's not proper English, but you know, you 
well, yeah, in context, it might yeah. even be amusing or whatever. Yeah, so. it might have like real kind of impact. Although when I was a kid, some of you who are a little closer to my age may remember, I ain't gonna say ain't because ain't ain't in the dictionary. dictionary. Yes. Remember that one? Right. Yes. yes. It is now in the dictionary, however. Mm -hmm. You guys had your hands up well, also. It's similar. Yeah. I mean, colloquialisms and slang, mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes regional expressions. Right. And what were you gonna say? I wasn't gonna, but idioms yeah. or yeah. yeah, that kind idioms. of idioms. Mm -hmm. It's faster. And in English, this isn't true of, of all languages, but when we speak quickly, we do delete a lot of sounds. And we don't care, because we're used to it, and we know what's there already, and we have this massive you know, context, we have this background, and it also depends on the situation that you're in. Again, if, <laughs> if I walk into the supermarket and they say, can I, can I, I, already, I, I know <laughs> what they're going to say, so it, doesn't even, it almost doesn't matter. Um, I, I would probably understand them even if they said the wrong thing. But um, it's like a form of shorthand. It is, and, it's j and everyday language, sadly, is the most difficult for learners. It's what they hear every day, and yet it's the hardest, in English anyway. So I want to pick up your comment about um, English um, running together would be the mm -hmm. hardest to understand, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, would you say that's or spoken rapidly? Would you mm -hmm. say that that's not that's more true than say, I've heard people speak rapidly in Italian or in Spanish? Yeah, it Spanish like speakers. Yeah. You all still enunciate a lot of syllables, don't you? Depends on where you're from. Yeah. yeah if you're from the islands, maybe. From the islands, yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm told that people from Cuba mumble terribly. <laughs> but. <laughs> It's Puerto Ricans <laughs> and Dominican <laughs> yes. Are they nice? And they but people from like Colombia right. are more Well, they think they're, they're like the highest. Oh, they do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've been told by people from Colombia, in fact, that they are the best. So, yeah. so they should know. Yeah, they should know, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Were you starting to oh, say no, something else? Basically, what Deborah was saying, I mean, yeah. a lot of it, too, is even the way they pronounce uh, certain words is mm -hmm. different. And some of the meaning is different. The yeah. Is different. So there are regional differences, there are differences in sort of social, socioeconomic group, neighborhoods. Um, I'm here in Georgia and I seem to understand all of you just fine, which is really great, but I'll tell you right now, we moved to Northern Virginia, which is not by most people's estimation, the South, from Philadelphia. It's all of, I think, 150 miles. My mother insisted she could not understand anyone. <laughs> and she said, these people, they have such an accent, you know. But it was, uh, th she had also, didn't have a good attitude. One of the things, though, is that um, bec you can become aware of certain sounds. You can also learn some of the everyday expressions. Some of them, you just have to learn them. You have to learn that what you means what are you? What you doing? What you doing? I don't know about y'all, but I say what you. <laughs> what you doing? What you doing? Well, it, sometimes it's ooh, sometimes it's uh. Depends on the, like, the emphasis, but what you doing? And sometimes it's just ch. What you doing? Hey, man, what you doing? Am I right? Okay. So that's pretty, that's pretty hmm. shocking for a learner. And some of them think, do kind of, I wonder, what's, what's wrong with you people, can't you? I've seen some of my, my students be, frankly, appalled that we don't make the effort to speak our language. Are we lazy? I don't know. Okay, let's not get into that. Let's not call people lazy. Let's not call them bad. It's not bad English. It's informal English. It's, some people say street language. Slang, okay, that's By all lazy right. People. Huh? By lazy people. By lazy people now. Hey, I'm one of those lazy people, watch <laughs> it. I okay, there are varieties of English. Um, some of the learners may have learned English in the countries they came from, and they are accustomed to hearing that English. The English they hear here is likely to be very different. Um, if you learned English in Nairobi or Kampala, um, I think you have some very nice English in Asmara, and, uh, but 
you may be accustomed to a very different accent, different set of sounds. Your, the English you learned overseas may have been um, British based. <coughs> you may have British <coughs> vocabulary. You may open the bonnet of your car and put things in the boot. Or um, you may refer to this as trousers and not pants. Okay? I'll just leave it at that. You can figure it out. So there are different, so there's different vocabulary. You may be somebody who tends to drop your R's if you are from a British colony. Father. My, my name, for example, in Uganda was always Mada, because they didn't say the R's. Um, then there's also African American and Southern American English varieties which are related. They are, those are the ones that a lot of learners say they find difficult to understand. It is the accent, it is the changes in the word forms. Um, one of the things I do want to emphasize though is that African American English is a system, it's a legitimate dialect of English. Now when I say dialect, that doesn't mean a substandard version, a lesser version. It's just a different, everybody speaks a different dialect, okay? We all do. I speak Delaware Valley English, Philadelphia English, okay? It has its own characteristics. Um, I won't go into them, they're not that interesting. Um, some of you come from different places right, or have different levels of education. And so each of your, a dialect is a variety, so each person has probably a somewhat different variety of English. African American English is spoken widely throughout the United States, but it retains a lot of its southern features, what I would consider southern. Some of those include things like pronouncing my name, Martha, right, or Mother even putting an R in a different place. So African American English, I want you to just realize it is, it, this is a little linguistic chart. I don't expect you to read all of this, but there are patterns that are different and these can be hard for learners to understand, uh, especially in the pronunciation. The, they often omit the third person plural S, which is common among many learners as well, or they use the, the form that's, that's not third person, like he don't know. Lots of people say he don't know. That is very common in non-standard English. Now, it's not what you want your learners necessarily to use or to speak, but it's good for them to understand it. They don't want to be lost. Uh, in African American English or other non-standard forms, you might say, she go, she go to the store every day. Um, he jump instead of he jumps. You use don't instead of do. He don't like it. My husband says this all the time. He's from South Jersey. He don't know nothing. <laughs> when you really mean that someone doesn't know anything, you don't say he doesn't know anything. You say he don't know nothing. Okay? Now, you might not say that in front of a class, and that's not necessarily what you want to teach, but people can learn to understand that. So I'm, I'm really shooting for a for comprehension here, not for you to teach people to speak African American or other non-standard forms. There's this kind of thing, he didn't do, didn't do nothing, he don't know nothing. Um, past tense where you use was instead of were. Um, a lot of missing past tense markers, that one is hard, where you drop final consonants. And it has to do, oh this is the famous one, it be, it be cold outside, it be cold all the time. That is a form that we lack in English, which is a, uh, what you would call a habitual present or a habitual form for the verb to be. So there are some innovations in African American English that are really useful and really nice. Young people will hear this all the time in music and other things having to do with popular culture. So my point here is it's good for them to understand it it's good for them to recognize that this is a form of English spoken by many people in many communities across the United States. Those people are not lazy or stupid. 
they speak a different kind of English. And many of them speak two or three different kinds of English. So they, uh, they're, they're multi-dialectal, and uh, they may choose to do that. OK. Now, as far as pronunciation <coughs> and things go, and learning about some of these things, one of the things I want to um, encourage you all to, to, you can use YouTube resources for many, many, many things. But there are some terrible English teachers on YouTube. I'm sorry to say. I have spent countless hours <laughs> digging through English teaching videos on YouTube. And I, you know, uh, there, there, are, there are a lot of good ones, but I don't want to share everybody on earth with you. For pronunciation, there's a, a speech therapist by the name of Keenan Rhodes, and there's another gal named Rachel. She has Rachel's English. Both of these gals are really good. And they have a lot of source. Yeah, mm -hmm. Lachlan. Are, are we going to get this uh, sure. point so that we'll sure. have the links? Oh, yeah, sure. To write it all yeah, down. definitely. Oh, you don't have to write down anything. Yeah, and I'll just, can just email all this to you. Will be available. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so that, for example, if you want to help people learn to understand something or practice, what are some of the sounds that, t that students, that learners find difficult? Th. You want to know why? You want to know why most people find th difficult to pronounce? You don't think it is if you're a native speaker of English, do you? You're like, what's the big deal? Th. It's very rare. The very few languages in the world have th and th. I don't know why. It's just one of those things. They don't have it. Um, interestingly enough, where we lived in East Africa, and among this group called the Karamajang, in their language, they don't hear any difference between s, z, th, and th. They interchange them all the time. They don't hear any, they, th to them, it's all the same sound, you know? Uh, you don't have that in any of your languages now, but in, in Aramaic. Talatha, Talatha kum, right? OK. So um, interestingly enough, the language that Jesus probably spoke, he had th. But the rest of us just have to practice. But it's very easy to practice. The advantage of using videos is that not only can you show people in class how to do something, but these videos will inc include things like sort of see through charts as though you were um, as though you were x-ray, not really an x-ray, but you know what I mean, like a, a chart of what somebody's mouth looks like so you can see where your tongue goes. Because it's a little hard to explain sometimes. Have you ever thought about how to tell someone how to make an American R? R. Just do that. R. R. OK. Try to think about how would you describe to someone else what you're doing with your mouth? You know, something like closing my eyes, like concentrate. R, R, R. Pirates, right? Pirates, absolutely, <laughs> pirates. But what if you don't have pirates where you come from? <laughs> <laughs> or they don't say R. Well, and, and you can't R, say things like R. the tip of your tongue needs to go here because they can't understand. <laughs> right, they can't, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes what I do is I use my hand to represent my tongue in my mouth. I'm not sure if it really works all that well. But it's, as you say, what can you do? <coughs> you can show them a chart, such as I would show you if I could pull that up. Um, you can use your hand and say, well, your tongue is like this. And you put back here. OK. And the tip. It doesn't, no, 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 don't do that, don't, err. And then you laugh, because it's hilarious, right? Everybody laughs. You try to make that very silly sound and try to have a good time. And they may never learn to make that sound. But you know, a flapped or a rolled R isn't that bad. R, 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 r. You know, it sounds OK a lot of the time. If I say I live on Nelson Road, that's not so terrible. OK? It's a, it's a step in the right direction. But other sounds, like the TH sound, is it terrible if you say 
this instead of this? Mm, it's not the worst. The context will, will help you. But if you say face instead of faith, or mouse instead of mouth, mm -hmm. you might be saying something you don't mean. OK? We used to sing in, Car <laughs> in Karamoja when we were there. We sang that song, I Will Sing of the Mercies of the Lord. And it was, we spy mouse, will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. And, and I loved it. It was, it was great. <laughs> Um, in actual fact, most of the people who were singing didn't actually speak English, so they were just enjoying the song, and we would explain it and stuff. But you know, with my mouse, I, will I make known thy faithfulness? There's there's the potential for misunderstanding there. But I guess coming back to Lachlan's point again and again, can people make themselves understood? And if you're working with a small group of students, maybe even one on one. Maybe you can find out what happened to them that week. Where did, was there a, a communication <coughs> breakdown? That's what we call it, a communication breakdown. When it breaks down completely, you've experienced your car breaking down. I hope not recently, but you know, we've, I guess we've all had it happen. I'll just write this here, communication breakdown. And then what do you need to to repair it, these are some of the things that you're going to try to teach is repair strategies. How can you do that? OK, let's say you break down. There's a breakdown in communication. But remember, what did I say was the most important thing in language acquisition, in learning a language? Ne Yes, negotiating or negotiation for, I'll say ting, I think it sounds better, for meaning, OK? So these breakdowns in communication are an opportunity. They may not feel like an opportunity to your learners, because it may have been an, uh, an unpleasant experience that they couldn't understand something. But working with you, hopefully you can make it a really positive experience by teaching them how to repair that. What do you think are some ways that students can, that learners can repair a communica communication breakdown? Obviously, it depends on the situation. This is an actual question. This is an actual question. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is, not a this is not a display question. No, it is a display question. Display away. <laughs> <laughs> In a classroom environment, if a student has made a mistake, usually I'll start by pointing out what they did well. Mm -hmm. um, that way they don't feel like I've just done everything wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here's what we did well and well here. OK, let's revisit this yeah. particular concept mm -hmm. and focus on that and see if they can themselves mm -hmm. um, understand what I'm getting at, or if there's a Socratic way of leading them to what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and and explain true, what you mean by Socratic. Um, I think I just gave you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good example. Yes, it's leading me to what you want. Yeah, and that's what right. you're, you're asking questions that are prompting certain yeah. response that you yeah. know will lead to the desired answer. Now, I think many of us are concerned about people whose communication is so limited that they can't really explain something. What about some of the rest of you? What do you think? How can you help somebody repair a breakdown in communication? How can you help them to communicate when they don't have the words? What else can they do? Verbal cues, nonverbal cues. Yeah, nonverbal cues such as? Um, sometimes even like demonstrating. Gestures. Yeah. Gestures. Gestures. Third parties. Mm. So you ask, I mean, if there's an breakdown, especially somebody that I don't understand the language. Yeah, yeah. They talk to a friend, they talk to me, and that I can hear happen. what they're getting at. Yeah, yeah. That can happen. Sometimes someone in the class has, has more um, knowledge. Yeah. I mean, you don't want, you have to be a little bit careful of that because you can end up with a situation where you have somebody who is, who uses a fellow student as a complete crutch. Right. 
and it just undermines the, the class. I, I have experienced that also. I had a tiny class one, one year and two weak students and two stronger ones. And it, to get them to sp stop speaking Arabic was almost impossible. They just, they just, and then there was the issue of age difference too because the, it was the younger ones who were, had better Arabic and so when the older person asked them to help, they couldn't refuse. So that's, so there are sometimes dynamics like that. Now I'm walking over here because there are lots of books over here. But one of them, this is a, this contains lesson plans from the Oxford Picture Dictionary. So one way to deal with beginning learners is using pictures. And these are all kind of contextualized, like this is the teacher's book, so it, the learner's book looks something like that. Um, so you have a picture of a classroom and it's got all the stuff in the, the right place and maybe you can use something like that. You use gestures, you use kind of charades. That's called the total physical response method, which I always thought was kind of a fancy name for just moving around, where you learn to say things by, by doing them. Let me give you a little example just for fun. I'm going to say, I'm going to guess that none of you here speak Irish Gaelic. Am I right? Am I good? Correct. We're good on that? Okay. Okay. Dimotasha. Teme mahi. Teme imahi. Teme imahasu. Teme imahasu. Teme mahi. Yeah, the, bo the light just went on, right? I'm standing up, I'm sitting down. Exactly. Yeah, a genius it does not take, right? It's like, oh, not that you guys aren't geniuses. Awfully sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, so things like that anybody can do. Now, obviously, there are limits to that. You know, you can't act out everything. You can't act out, well, you can act out how you feel. You can demonstrate how you feel about things. You may not be able to have a lengthy conversation about, you know, economic policy in the European Union, but I wouldn't be doing that anyway. But for, for a lot of everyday things, you really can act them out. And it's a bit of fun. If you're teaching in a home, the things are there. When I was learning Karamajang, that's what we did. We peeled potatoes. We hoed in the garden. We washed clothes. We hung things up. You know, I had this great vocabulary of all sorts of everyday things because I did them every day. And thankfully, this lovely lady helped me. Yeah. What are your thoughts on um, in the classroom, out of the classroom teaching? Like when I, when I yeah. taught and built out, my best lessons were just like, let's just go on a walk or like yeah. do something. Yeah. Because like, if you're in the yeah. classroom, you can really, I mean, sometimes it's better and, and sometimes it's just better to yeah. be more, more professional. But it, really, it can really limit you. You're just sitting at a desk. Well, yeah, because you're having to create things. You're having to create reality or create something that people will actually experience. It has, what do you think are the advantages of being in a classroom? Control. Yes. Control. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Attention. Attention. Yeah. Yeah. Attachment. Mm -hmm. Routine. Routine. Yeah. So there are, there are positives. It depends on your students. You could try some of these other things depending on your situation. It can be utter chaos to try to teach in someone's home um, because they may have kids going in and out, the phone ringing or going <coughs> off, you know, TVs in the background and, you know, people, it's just too many people. Um, but on the other hand, that may be where you can, if, if, that, if your learner can focus in that situation, then they may retain what they're learning because they also connect it to the environment. So after you leave the next, at the next day, maybe when they're washing the dishes, they're going to remember, wash, washed, washed. I washed the dishes. I am washing. Shh, shh. And they can, you know, so I don't know, something like that. That's what I did when I was learning. Um, just, I like that. Having 
Um, as I think I mentioned, um, or I will mention, let me see, it's later on here. You'll get some of these links later. But I realize we're coming up on the end of our time here, so we're going to um, do some things later. Let me just interrupt for just a moment. One of the things we talked, you and I were talking about this last night, is using um, short videos that show native speakers doing certain things like introductions so that people can watch and listen. They can, these are really short. These are all like, you know, three minutes, two minutes long or something. How they do these things, how they do a phone conversation. <coughs> You can look at those in class, point out some things, then have them practice. They can look at them later for another kind of situation. Um, let me jump ahead a little bit. Whoops. OK. We'll talk some more about this tomorrow, because we could spend hours. And I want to actually practice some of these things, like try them out. right? But the first thing I want to say is multisensory activities. If at all possible, the more channels of input that a person has, the more likely they are to retain things, the more likely they are to memorize, the more neural pathways they'll connect with. Um, if you think of vocabulary acquisition as you know, kind of plugging something into a network, the more things it touches, the better. So that if you learn, if you do learn, tema mahi, tema mahasu, tema mahi, tema mahasu, which I did, um, by standing and sitting, you know, and walking, moving. Um, sometimes people use songs. Now, songs can sometimes turn into mindless uh, just reciting sounds. Like my daughters who can sing all these songs from Bollywood movies, but they don't speak Hindi. <laughs> or, uh, you know, so you want the songs to be meaningful, right? Um, but eating, drinking, associating things with places, colors, people. When you're learning a language, you, you don't just you know, sit there and repeat like one little thing over and over. When you have learned your own language, you learned it by interacting with people. Things happened. Uh, you got the food you wanted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or you, you, know, you expressed yourself and you got things that you needed and wanted. Um, so if you can make things a more lively and involved, even if it's kind of hokey and contrived, OK? Even if you learn, well, we used to do writing activities. You know, and we'd learn the letter A, and we'd go, you know, uh, well, it was in a different language. But anyway, it was right? <laughs> and that's how we did the letter A. And the teachers in Eritrea were were brilliant at that. I don't know if you remember when you were, well, maybe you don't remember when you were learning. It was a long time ago. I remember your mother taught you, and she would point with a spoon in the kitchen. Am I right? Yeah? <laughs> um, and, you know, things like that. Associating, associating learning with food is, I'm not going to lie, it's a good thing. What did you just say? Any oh, what did, I, what, did I, what did I do? Kidiyama kwa. You formed an A, I guess. So. I, up. Oh. Down. That's all I said. Up, down. Yeah. And that's actually Carmen John. Yeah. And across. Yeah. That's all I did. But, you know, you say it in this kind of dramatic yeah. way, <laughs> and it makes it a little more fun. And even adults, let them be a little bit silly. It's not going to, yeah, most of them are not so uptight that they're going to mind doing that. They might not love doing it in front of a big group of people, but in a small class, why not? And if you demonstrate that it's fun and f funny to do that, um, who knows? That might become part of their exercise routine or something like that. They can teach their kids. Um, so, you know, we talked about role play. Again, this total physical response. Now, that particular method refers to learning um, where you don't use the, any, uh, you only use the target language. The target language here being English, you don't use the learner's native language. You don't translate anything ever. You just use charades, and you just move, and you use that, that language. Um, another thing that I thought was, was really good, a friend of mine mentioned, is giving feedback with gestures. Developing a set of gestures that indicate to students whether what they've said or done is correct, 
Um, and these can be kind of friendly, and they sometimes can feel a little less judgmental, you know? Um, obviously, everybody loves it when you're like, yes, yes, you know, for the positive ones. But for the negative ones, maybe sometimes it's a little gentler to just have somebody say, oh, rather than saying, no, that wasn't very good. You know, it's, it has less, might be a little more gentle. Some teachers have found that. Um, we can practice doing some of these in like kind of practice lessons tomorrow. I hope you're able to be here. Uh, there are lots of games, simple games, nothing too complicated. I don't know, memory, flipping things over, matching things, saying the names. Even like, I, I always just like the memory game. You know, you have these little cards, and there's two of each thing, and you flip them over, and you say the name of it. You know, it is a, it is not, and so on, you know. So if you, you're trying to, there's a group of cards, and you're looking for, <coughs> you flip one over, and it's a dog, and you're looking for the other dog. You say, this one is a dog. And what are you looking for? I'm looking for a dog. No, that's a cat. That, no, that's a fish. You know, things like that. They're, they're simple, but they, they can be household objects. There are lots of memory games, just flipping over cards like that, simple things. Um, those can be used for learning the alphabet as well. Um, the Oxford Picture Dictionary, some people just go straight to that. They just use the Oxford Picture, di picture Dictionary. They, did I say that right? Pitch? Picture really Dictionary. Yeah, I did just say the wrong thing, didn't I? Yeah, that's right. Picture Dictionary, thank you. I'll just call it the OPD, because that's, that's easier. And they'll just go to a setting and work on that. People can point at things. You can then ask them, do you have? You can hand them something, like the thing that's in the picture. Do you have, do you have a cup? Do you have a cup? Yes, I have a cup. Here, Karen, here's a cup. I have a cup. I have a cup. Does Karen have a cup? Not anymore, because I took it back. But I mean, <laughs> yes, yeah. here. Karen has a cup. She has a cup. You know, that kind of thing. Where you're just building on, maybe you learned cup the week before. Maybe <coughs> you just know I. Maybe you only know I and you. Then the next week you go to I, you, she, and he. If she and he is easy, you're good to go. You may have students who struggle with she and he much of their lives. Yes? The one thing about when you said you have a cup, ordinarily when mm -hmm. I, they would say you have a cup. Mm -hmm. Oh, know. yeah. So they just repeat what you're saying sometimes. So That's right. But that's an opportunity to mm -hmm. do something else. But yeah, and then ask a question. Sometimes you don't get the results that you think you're no, getting. Some, exactly, because sometimes people will think that you're saying to repeat, which is why, as you were mentioning, like routines can be helpful. One routine that I used for verbs when I was learning was I always had them, uh, had people tell me the verb forms in the first, second, and third singular, first, second, and third plural. That isn't always necessary with English, and you, you wouldn't want to do that with beginners, I don't think, um, because it's, it's too much to handle at once. You might want to just work with the I and U forms, and singular, and then add, this, I mean, this is one way of doing it. It's, you know, there are, there are many approaches. It's not like there's one perfect way of doing it. This is something I might suggest, but you might have done it a different way, or others who have taught do it a different way. But start with I and U then go to he and she. As I say, those might be super hard for some people who don't have those in their language. In East Africa, in the Bantu languages, there's one word for he, she, and it. I had people who were university professors, who, you know, like senior officials in the government. They'd get that he and she wrong all the time. And it was, it was, it seemed so basic to us, but it wasn't basic to them. It was actually really hard. <coughs> what are you nodding about? Yeah. I was going to say, that explains a lot. Yes. Yeah. We had a lot of Somalis, and they always yeah. used the wrong mm -hmm. pronoun. I, I didn't quite get it, but yeah. if they only had one. 
Yeah. It's like we have all these tissues. For yeah, we right? have these. Like, that's an important thing. You, and especially, yeah, we have more and more all the time, and now you have to figure out whose pronouns are which. And then someone in their infinite wisdom decided that the non-binary pronoun in English would be they. Yeah. <laughs> they. Yeah. I got to be honest, it bugs me to death. They is plural. Mm -hmm. I mean, right enough, we do say things like, Somebody's coming over today, but I don't know what time they're going to be here. Okay? We use some, that's we occasionally, that's a colloquial thing, and we sometimes use they for singular, but I, I must admit I do find that difficult. Okay. There are some more things I can, uh, I can show you some little videos of something called the Growing Participator Approach. It's used by a lot of missionaries who are learning the language of the <coughs> people in the place where they are going, and it has to do with. Again, a lot of the time it's just uh, using little figures, speaking only in the local language, or the target language, not, not using any other language. It involves a certain amount of charades and pointing and figures and repetition. Uh, it's a very slow kind of teaching method. It requires a lot of patience and self-control on the part of the teacher who will be just dying to tell them how to say it right because they have to keep guessing it, it's it's yeah it's it's meant for it's meant for people to develop relationships so it's a very slow moving teaching approach i'll show you some little video clips of that i say grammar through examples what do you think i mean by that grammar through examples Teaching grammar through examples. Is it like example sentences or something? Mm -hmm. Taking a line like you did with Karen, and she mm -hmm. has a cup, you have the cup, mm -hmm. you took the cup. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Maybe expand on that to different. Uh, yes. Yeah. Rather than saying <coughs> the third person singular of regular verbs right. normally mm -hmm. has an S in the final position. Now, how many of you are going to go out and speak English well after I just told you that? I'm not a, I, to be honest with you, I've studied linguistics, you know, pretty much all my life, and I am not a fan of explicit grammar instruction of that type, where you tell someone a rule and then expect them to apply it. You can tell them the rule if you really want to, but I think showing them and having them use it in meaningful sentences and conversation is a much better way of having them learn it. It also gets you out of having to explain things. If somebody says, well, why do you have that S there? Anybody want to tell me why there's an S on the end of third person singular present tense verbs? Right. You don't know. <laughs> like so, so explaining a rule, I actually don't know either. It's a, um, it's a remnant of, there used to be endings, different endings on a lot of verbs in English. And that's, that's the one that remained. After all those French people couldn't speak English. Mm -hmm. You can blame the French. All right, it's after 8 o'clock, I see. So I don't want to over-torture you, as we say in Uganda. Um, I jumped over some of this, so we can do some more with it tomorrow can demonstrate some of the things and let you actually try out some of these little activities so you get a sense of what it feels like and you can take some time to look at the books. At this stage in the game, I want to just wrap up. Um, one of the things that um, I, I just want to share that uh, Deborah shared some really uh, wonderful um, memories of experiences with learners and so I guess I just want everybody to focus on those how on those friendships and the relationships that you form with your learners and I, I've over the years just been astonished at how how kind people were and appreciative and the um, those real bonds of affection can can be a real blessing to to all concerned and hopefully as you say, you're showing them the love of Christ through, through taking your time. Everybody knows time's valuable, and for you taking your time, it's a, it's a good thing. So, well, I think we'll wrap it up for now. 
these books are going to be here. I mean, these books are going to be here permanently. These are a gift. Uh, don't sweat it. I, I, it's actually, but some of them are a gift for me personally because I, I got them to try out and I thought, eh, they weren't quite what I was looking for, but they might be what some of your learners are looking for. But you can thank the University of Pennsylvania English Language <laughs> Programs who um, bought some new books recently and said, oh, we'd love to find a nice home. And they wanted them to go to a good home. And I said this was a good home. <laughs> so there are more advanced ones on specific subjects and more academic. There are more uh, beginners, learners books over on this table. And then I will also bring some other things in. Um, the, OP, the folks at the OP Church in Florida who have an ESL program, they also use this very popular book called Side by Side. It's not an explicitly Christian book. None of, none of these are. Uh, well, actually, the ones by Laubach. These, these reading books were put together by somebody that did a lot of, lot of mission work. I have PDFs of other um, Bible-based um, programs. The problem with their materials is they're not extremely attractive. They're, they're black and white, as I think I mentioned. They look like they were typed on some typewriter in the 80s. You know, they just, they're not, they're not sharp. These are a bit nicer looking. There are workbooks, CDs. Yes, there are CDs. Uh, and, uh, and teacher's guides, these are readily available online at a reasonable cost. Let me see, I can't really show you the book too well. But anyway, I'll bring the, the other book in. And that these other ones could be supplements. And we can actually look through these tomorrow and kind of page through them. I can point out a few things that I hope will be useful, okay? So I don't wanna, I don't wanna keep you forever. So thanks very much for, for now. I hope this has gotten you thinking, and for tomorrow, I want you to let this sink in a little bit and think about maybe something you take issue with. You say, wait a second, you said, uh, I don't buy that. I don't mind. I'd, I'd love to hear what you think, what your experiences have been, and can you think of examples of Try to imagine some situations you may be in with your future learners where you could help them. And maybe you can also be aware of people as you're out and about who are struggling to communicate. And maybe you can't speak Mandarin, but you might be able to help them get through something. I had that happen to me one time and it was, I felt, I felt really good. <laughs> I was really happy. This poor person was at the airport and they had some really precious food in their, in their luggage and they weren't allowed to take it on and they were beside themselves because like their mother had given it to them yeah. and they weren't allowed to, <laughs> and you know, and I was trying to, I was trying, uh, anyway, I think I helped explain a little <coughs> bit despite my lack of Mandarin. But you know, there are plenty of times when you might be able to be that, to show that kindness to somebody. Um, and anyway. I'll let you go for now, and thanks very much. Thank you. And uh, be thinking of what what we want to do tomorrow. Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah.